everyone to the knowledge panel. I will quickly introduce the theme and then the panelists and myself. Is our conception of knowledge outdated, part of the analog era and needs to be revised and refreshed? Do binaries between intelligence and ignorance need nuancing and complexifying? How can we problematize knowledge? How can we think beyond traditional categories or understandings of how we know? Through what bodily or mental mechanisms do we know? What does it mean to be a knower, to share knowledge, and what material or social forms need to be reconsidered for altering our knowledge landscape? Today, we will be exploring these themes and seeking to retool the language frames around terms like knowledge, thinking, and consciousness. My name is Michael Kaitler. I'm a postdoc researcher at KU Leuven in the Department of Architecture. And I have the great honor of introducing Indy Johar and Sarat Maharaj today, uh, with whom we will be discussing these very fascinating and quite um, provocative questions related to knowledge. I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction uh, to each of them. Indy uh, is an architect, co-founder of Project Zero Zero, and most recently, Dark Matter Labs. Indy has co-founded multiple social ventures from Impact Hub Westminster to Impact Hub Birmingham, along with, um, with working with large global multinationals and institutions to support their transition to a positive systems economy. And he's taught in multiple uh, universities and institutions around the world. Uh, Sarat with us um, is a professor of visual art and knowledge systems at Lund University and Malmo Art Academy in Sweden, as well as a research professor at Goldsmiths in London with a specialization in uh, the works of Richard Hamilton, Marcel Duchamp, uh, James Joyce, amongst others. He's also involved in curating with events such as Documenta 11, the Sao Paulo Biennial in 2010, and Guangzhou in um, the Triennial in 2008, and uh, many more. For those who would like more info on our panelists, please check out the Telegram group where the full bio is posted. Moreover, if you're not already part of the Telegram group, I strongly encourage you to join. There's already uh, there's been some really amazing discussions over the last two days there, and so I would assume that will follow with this, uh, with this exciting panel. So please do join us. And to get going for this panel, uh, I'm going to ask a kind of short to the point question uh, in order to elicit a kind of short to the point answer to position our two panelists on the theme of knowledge. So here, focusing on our current and future social, ecological, human crises, and we're on a panel on knowledge. Why do we need a panel on knowledge? Is there a knowledge crisis? Uh, Indy, can we start with you? Um, yeah, it's um, a nice, lovely to start with a lovely, easy question. Good afternoon. Um, I think I think it's worth talking about the subject. I think it's an important subject for us to reflect on. Um, I think there are several key components, sort of issues to start with. One is is you know, we often talk about knowledge and intelligence and knowledge societies, 2001, all this kind of, kind of language was around. But in an emergent complex world, is the ossification of knowledge or the kind of uh, commodification of knowledge the issue? And I, and I wonder whether this is kind of part of a way of seeing the world by segmenting it into a series of commodities. Whereas actually in an entangled world, um, in a sm small, entangled, and complex emergent world, is the abstraction and commodification of knowledge itself a problem and is part of a thesis. Second, I think who is the subject in, in, in this knowledge story? I think that's also really key. The latent subject is, is either theoretically humans or a human or humans or human systems. And I think what's kind of interesting is to sort of transcend that thesis and sort of talk about, in a way, what if we were to perceive the world? And again, it's Friday afternoon, uh, sorry, Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon, so we can go slightly philosophical, but if the subject is kind of the consciousness of the planet rather than human consciousness or human systems or human endeavor. So 
I think the question is important, and I think if we're going to explore the thesis of how we be how we are human in the 21st century, I think this is a fundamental commodity issue problem that we need to analyze and reconstruct into a new thesis. And I think it's I think it's part of the strategic problem, in a way, the thesis on knowledge as we've constructed it. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. And but I think that's that's a key issue. Yes. Great. Thank you, Surat. Yes, uh, thank you, Indy. That's a very interesting and perceptive answer. I wish I could respond more directly to that. But uh, I would say in answering Michael's question about, is there a crisis? Yes, to the extent that we claim to be a knowledge society, this claim has become so commonplace and so much part of everyday language. But what exactly do we mean by this? and knowledge society, the knowledge economy, the knowledge everyday world has been essentially reduced to smart infrastructures and the smartness of our activity organized and placed in particular regimes of input and output. I think this is one side of uh, the knowledge society that interests me that um, it claims to be a know-all society, that it has taken over and governed and organized and administered almost every domain of everyday life today. Things that are left out are being drawn into its gravitational pull to be organized as knowledge. But what kind of knowledge? What sort of knowledge? So there is what I call a pan-sophic society, a pan-sophic society by which I mean that the claims to knowing and knowledge and being in knowledge, and sophic has that element, the, the charge of being a society that's wise to itself, wisdom, and that it's a, a pan event, it's, it's a universal kind of condition. I question whether it is um, universal and wise, because what we have seen in the knowledge society and perhaps our, our pandemic today has highlighted and illuminated the thing is the authority of the scientific method, that this has ascended with the ascendancy of algorithmic thinking. So these two elements I would take up and, and draw out of the notion of knowledge society today in its crisis, to bring it under scrutiny, to bring it under some sort of question to say, well, if the methodology of science is so highly regarded and to some extent glorified, it's quite interesting when we see the media today and our journalists and our politicians constantly claiming that they have the authority of science behind the particular uh, policies and the particular strategies they're offering to society to deal with the viral cloud. Uh, and that uh, these in fact are very different voices we hear from science itself. Science has different models, different voices, different arguments different perspectives and of course there's also personal rivalries between schools in the sciences but nevertheless they are presented as a unified uh, authenticating kind of center from which everything else is to be judged and examined but what does it leave out what is the unsystematic chaotic open-ended areas of mental activity and dimensions of consciousness which are increasingly swept to the margins and seen as mumbo jumbo and seen as completely uh, delegitimated. So for me, that is the element of crisis that I'm interested in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it's a nice strong start off. Now, both of you have, elaborated on a notion of knowledge which seems to be in need of a, an update, for lack of a better term. And 
which makes me feel almost that how we conceive of knowledge today is simply outdated for our needs, one, for our tools. Uh, we are stuck in what might be described as the, the analog knowledge world in which Indy, uh, you once described as being kind of defined by separation, dominion and control. If you agree that knowledge does need to be updated or at least that our knowledge currently is out of date, what should come next? What is the natural successor or at least what is the desired successor to our existing uh, knowledge system, which is, as Surat said, um, perhaps overly um, uh, well, artificially tight um, and closed, and as Indy was saying, um, perhaps simply too abstract. Jump in. Well, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'm happy to sort of uh, jump in. I think the problem of knowledge is cannot be answered through it's the question that it sets up is um is problematic because i think the problem starts somewhere else so i think the problem starts in our and i think this is why this festival is really critical in a in a redescription of what it means to be human and only in a redescription of the, what of describing what it means to be human do we redefine our relationship and our abstraction or our comprehension of the world. So, and our relationship with the world. So I would say we may find knowledge is an architecture of a machined comprehension of the world where, yes, as you rightly said, you know, it's, uh, it's attachment, dominion and control and control using knowledge and information. And it doesn't take account of and as kind of, and all of that, worldview requires a kind of almost a quasi-scientific method as a, as a linear thesis of the world, uh, which actually doesn't take account, as I was rightly saying, of actually our new comprehensions of reality. So I, I think I think knowledge itself is a kind of a, a sort of a symptom point of failure, but not necessarily the place to start renewing the conversation, I would argue. I think the renewal of the conversation starts at a much deeper root at the question of what it means to be human and redefining our, our relationship as much more entangled and embedded rather than detached. And that thesis then opens up a completely different thesis of relationship to being in code, to being recognizing humans as a multitude, recognizing humans as an, as an interdependent relationship, recognizing an interdependence in space and time. It, rec it builds within it a different thesis of consciousness, not of individuals, but actually a quite uh, interdependent consciousness. And that, I think, opens up a whole new paradigm of to be in knowledge. Or, and I'm not even sure knowledge, I would tend to prefer the word of being in practice or to being in relationship with rather than actually to be knowledgeable, uh, which is the act of consumption and storage, which I think is, again, this idea of isolation and siloism as a language structure. So it reconstructs, I think, the, I think it's a great problem description, but I think if we follow it through, it won't give us a paradigm space to actually open up and dissect the question. And my intuition is we have to start exactly with this festival starting to kick off, is to actually open up this conversation from the paradigm of reimagining our consciousnessness. And I think in that paradigm, more and more, what's, you know, the, the kind of line of arc that I'm very intrigued by is this thesis of if we are the spark of a planetary consciousnessness and the planetary consciousnessness, and I think that's a carbon and silicon hybrid, by the way. So I, I, this is not some romantic, I think it's a carbon silicon hybrid planetary consciousnessness that we're growing, we're part of. And that itself is a spark of consciousnessness in the, in the universe. And this is an emergent force of nature in itself. We are an emergent realization in nature itself. And that questions ourselves as individuals, as sovereignty, all of those things start to be questioned. And that uh, I think that's where we have to start. And I think, you know, and Surat in our previous conversation was very elegantly speaking about how, you know, if you look back in the 1960s, quantum physics philosophers, they were all talking to, to quantum physics scientists, they were all talking to the philosophers and Eastern philosophers, talking about how the kind of to discover new language and frames. And David Bowman and all those guys were all in, uh, in conversation, because I think this requires a different thesis of our relationship to the world, and that opens up the future. 
Um, and I, I think so knowledge itself is a great problem descriptor, but I don't think it's a way to pathway to get into the story. Um, and the pathway has to be redefining ourselves. And I think we're in the middle of that, by the way. So I'll, I'll come, and I think that redefinition is not just to ourselves, it's also our redefinition with each other, redefinition with, with the future, which I think is still about control and consumption and colonialization, our relationship with things, which is about ownership and enslavement, our relationship with nature, which is again about resource and extraction. So it's a, it's a foundational transition of all those things. And where we use knowledge as a thesis of, as to empower our mechanisms of control rather than to be in treaty with. I think there's something much more critical to be done. And again, I, I, I think we're at the beginning, I certainly are aware at the beginning of that story. I think there's many other greater people like Sarath and other people who are thinking harder around that part of the story. Okay, great. Thank you, Indy. Um, okay, Sarat, would you also like to respond? Um, yes, I could only add, I suppose, footnotes to what Indy has said with regard to this. I think it's important to stress that in speaking of knowledge, we do take into account historical developments. We don't have this notion of a primordial thing called knowledge that we are reclaiming down the ages, or that there is <clears throat> something like the perennial philosophy that we are claiming. I think our historical circumstances shape the understanding of knowledge. Today, the idea of something being knowledge or pseudo-knowledge, knowledge or uh, science or pseudoscience, as was the big central debate in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, which comes to an end by the 60s, when there is the end of that kind of certitude that we know how to draw the line between, and I have, of course, in mind here, thinkers like Isabel Stengers, who we have on this uh, group, and, and uh, Prigogine, Ilya Prigogine, and at the end of the certitude that comes with uh, the 60s and 70s does open us to all kinds of thinking that once again we're called new age thinking or, or simply uh, you know, sentimental spiritualism from uh, if, if we take the, uh, the design for living that uh, opened the post-war era in, in Britain, the design for living was an attempt to redesign every aspect of life from housing right through to the way one dressed and the way one walked and the way one held oneself in, in social context, the way one spoke, a new way of speaking English was also designed for the post-war period more democratic, or as it was put in the language of the time, more meritocratic forms of pronunciation. So from that, we arrive in the 60s with something like the design for dying by, um, by Leary. And I think in that, Leary speaks of the limited nature of logic, of the very uh, possibility of what a post-biological definition of the human might be, how we might rethink what we mean by the human and not be caught up in ideas of the human which are essentially humanistic, that is come down from Renaissance uh, thinking and post-Renaissance thinking from, from uh, areas of Protestantism and the Reformation which questioned the old world of Catholicism that the Reformation thinking produces the notion that the human is sovereign in the world, that the human is the custodian of nature, that we are in charge of, of uh, reality, and that this, I think, still hangs on today when we speak of saving the world, of saving, uh, of being the saviors of uh, the ecological crisis that faces us we see ourselves essentially as central to the drama of the planet and the universe, when in fact, we have to take on board a far more uh, sort of a, a role that's far more marginal than the one 
we have given ourselves over the last 500 years, which also fueled colonialism, which fueled notions of building empires over other civilizations. Uh, I'm talking of Eurocentric uh, notions of sovereignty and the sovereign human. So that would be central to questioning how do we know how do we get away from this idea that knowledge is just an accumulation of truths held somewhere in a mega archive back to the notion that knowledge is a series of practices. It's a spectrum of activities, of being in the world, of engaging with others, of interacting, and that this covers a spectrum of activities that of course at one end we have the knowledge experts and the specialists but as we we do know even experts have to be questioned and put under scrutiny and this happens when we uh, stop seeing knowledge as only something produced at the rarefied and elevated levels of certain disciplines rather than as something that is part of our everyday uh, interaction with the world and is centered in immersive experience, as it were, and emerges from that. And that means that we have to rethink uh, the, the supreme place we have given to the intellect and to mentalist definitions of uh, the human and move to broader notions of consciousness and to also take on board the non-cognitive dimensions of being in the world. That I think perhaps reminds us partly of our animal and plant connections and also then makes us redefine how we interact with those worlds of the, the animal and the non-human as well. Okay, so then I'm going to follow up to both of you because I, I find it interesting how you are speaking quite in parallel with each other um, in terms of moving beyond our existing knowledge framework. Uh, but practically speaking, I mean, Surat, you're an educator. Indy, um, you're involved in a range of institutions um, reshaping uh, public uh, well, in institutional discourse. How, if we cannot think ourselves out of a knowledge framework, um, then how do we, because if thinking is part of the problem, we cannot therefore think our way out. Um, how do we shift to this new, let's say, kind of relational um, way of being, this new consciousness? How do we practically get there? Uh, either of you can jump in. I hope I'm not speaking too much and, and hogging, as it were, uh, the idea for me, of course, looking at the academy, looking at the university is a very empirical, very concrete situation in which these questions emerge. So I, I would say that it, it goes right down to what we mean by, by education, by, by teaching. And I would move away from the notion of teaching and lecturing to uh, students, I would begin to think that the, the gathering is about a joint learning and the production of a joint expertise. It's not about handing over organized expertise. This is why I would hold on to the term knowledge production as opposed to what is current in our institutions, which is knowledge transfer where we see something that is already established, already polished and received, and all that we as, as people involved as teachers, lecturers, tutors, have to do is to hand over and to supervise the handing. The language already suggests a certain kind of hierarchical relationship, rather than a productive, creative one in which we might be totally surprised at the source from which new knowledge begins to emerge and is produced when we think of it as a situation of joint learning, mm -hmm. when we think of it as coming together and sharing uh, insight, understanding, experience, and building out the problematics of, of knowledge from that. 
So I do see it in slightly more modest terms, though the question might have been posed in very grand terms of, uh, of um, consciousness and what have you. But in dealing with the situation, I would say one is speaking of situations of learning. One is speaking of places of learning. And uh, these might be again, both in the wall, within the walls of the university and completely outside it. And, and that is why for me, art and art practice is so important that it is a way of learning in which there is no protocol or at mm -hmm. least for contemporary art that unlike the laboratory, though we have in many ways rather plundered the language of science and called ourselves as art laboratories and knowledge laboratories in the world of art, but unlike the laboratory, or maybe we're talking about a laboratory at such an elevated level where there is no given protocol, where creativity flourishes because we are in a state what, of what I call cluelessness, a state of ignorance. We don't know what question will be produced. We have to learn how to produce the question by being together and sharing this insight together. And so the state of cluelessness, which is so derided in, uh, in society as a whole, is for me one of the most creative situations to be in. Okay, great. Uh, Indy, would you like to respond? I mean, I, I suppose in terms of trying to make this kind of land, I, I think this manifests in lots of things. So uh, this kind of discourse, while seeming rarefied, it manifests in a very simple idea of um, property rights. Mm. So a property right is about effectively the kind of uh, the monopolized control and uh, assessment of an area for your utility. It's a it's a it's a relationship structure firmly embedded into it. So it's also about how you construct the dominion of that control in terms of GIS property uh, GIS property maps or GIS based property maps or all the way through to various other things. So it, it for me it's manifesting in these institutional architectures. So the employment contract is another one which constructs a relationship of power and authority and the predication of role. So I will define the role the other person will play. That is a relationship of construction of power and comprehension of the third party. So you can then just, I mean, these are just two, that you can then start manifesting them all the way through. So I would say pretty much all of our relationships, whether it's actually the value of a tree, the value of a tree is abstracted into the value of timber as opposed to the complex interdependencies of the whole system's value uh, of a tree itself. And that's to do with the abstraction of knowledge and the efficacy of what we can abstract as knowledge and commodify in that process. So I, I think we can talk about this as in a rarefied sense, but actually this manifests practically in, you know, um, in cities like Sheffield who cut down all their trees because their accounting infrastructure, their knowledge infrastructure, did not perceive the value, or environmental value of trees, but could see the costs of trees. So the frameworks of knowledge, which are so reductive and micro, are actually destroying our comprehension of the actual real world utility, real world comprehension and relational value of that entity. So I think, I think this, this can feel a philosophical argument, but it's not. It's actually a deeply practical argument about how we construct our relationships with the world. So, I mean, those are, and those are, these are just examples that we're working on all the way through to James, uh, James Scott's kind of seeing like a state, which constructs a whole thesis of dominion and power and mechanisms. So how we take measurement and that itself is a mechanism of knowledge, knowledge formation, which thereby creates power and utility and understanding in a very particular way. So I don't see these as philosophical discourses. I see these as kind of practical, philosophical discourses that manifest in actual actions. And these actions are now critical. I suppose that's the point I want to get to, is that I don't think these are, I think we are in the midst of a fundamental transition. You know, climate change is not about CO2, right? Let's just, you know, climate change is a fundamental failure in our relationship with the world, right? That's what's at the root of it. It's not CO2. You fix CO2, we still die as a species. It is about our relationship failure. And the relationship failure 
is fundamentally our relationship with the world. And that's why I say this is a deep transition. We're in the midst of a deep transition, as we were at the edge of kind of when people were like, you know, Newton, Newton himself was a polymathic thinker, uh, but he constructed the basis of a, of a very particular worldview that then stretched out to a very linear model of thinking. We've reduced our polymathic thinking capacity to very simple points. So I think we're in the moment where effectively we have to reimagine actually our relationship with the world very much to how we construct it in history. And I think that relationship has been building since the 1960s. We have you know, the, the, the scientific understanding, the human understanding, um, all the way through to actually our technological infrastructures. These have all been evolving to challenge the solid model of thinking. So I, I mean, just to put that there, I know. We carry on with the next question, but I, I think it's really practical. No, I, th I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. And, yeah. and for those um, who aren't familiar with Indy's work, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at some of his uh, descriptions of decoding these um, underlying systems, which have these ongoing effects and how we relate to the world, which uh, Indy's touching on now. Now, I think we, we're kind of running a little bit low on time. So I'd like to ask a final question. Uh, this is kind of the, the philosophical ending. Uh, perhaps, um, you know, both of you flag these kind of ethical responsibilities uh, related to knowledge and, and by virtue of that also being a, a knower, uh, someone perhaps, uh, or maybe using the language of Indy, um, being conscious or being in relation um, to others also um, relating to Surat's work. But what does it mean to know today? Uh, and what will it mean in the future? Or what does it mean to be a knower? And what will that mean in the future? So it's the grand uh, vision I'm hoping for to kind of leave off with a philosophical hook for our audience. As, uh, Surat, would you like to say, would you like to start? Oh, um, well, of course it is a classic question. Uh, who is the knower? and who, what is the object of knowing? I think maybe the poets have answered this. If we take Yeats, Yeats's famous line uh, from his late Sanskrit-oriented poetry, uh, who can tell the dancer from the dance? And that echoes from ancient Indian thought in the philosophical systems of India, one of the six ancient philosophical systems, who can tell the knower from the field of knowing? Shetra, Shetra who could say, who is the one who captures the field of knowledge? Uh, and this immersive element, this element that you cannot really ultimately in the, in the true act of knowing something, draw a distinction between subject and object, that these begin to give us a field in which we dissolve ourselves or are dissolved, might again seem a little bit remote, but I think is an important sobering reminder that our notion of the sovereign knower who then decides to know a particular thing in a particular way this might have its own beauty that you know it in the way of a, a dissection, you know it in the way of a analytical cut up of the object, you know it in the way of breaking it into fragments, parts, particles. But in the longer run, that is not a holistic way of knowing. And maybe this is what we still aim for in speaking of the knower and the field of knowing or the object of knowing dissolving into, into a state of being in the know rather than the knower, which suggests all the elements of hierarchy, control, and as it were, primacy. Great, thank you, Surat. Very nice, Indy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I can do that much better than add some footnotes to that one. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that in a way, the question articulates the problem that we face is that our language structures are still locked into object orientation, subject-object 
differentiation perspectives. So, you know, the English language, which we're having this conversation with is 80% constructed out of nouns and object oriented worldviews. So what we've got is a language which is still trying to bridge into a new thesis. And I think that's where our fundamental failures are. Um, I, I mean, whether I, I mean, the one thing I would suggest is, and again, probably cutting a fine line is, is it an act of becoming uh, or being? And I'm sort of probably sitting on the becoming line a little bit uh, of becoming into knowledge, um, as in it is a continuous unfolding field as opposed to it ever being resulting in that. So um, I, I think the real question at the center of it is, is how do we question, for me, the, the, for my personal challenge, is how do we resolve the thesis of, of, um, of sovereign interdependencies and the, the kind of becoming, the becoming of interdependent and that being in that, cons the being in interdependence and what that requires and the consciousness and behaviors that requires. And I think in that result probably is the, the thesis which has the implicate order of resolving that question. So I can point out where the, where the source truth might be, but I don't know it. Mm, really that's honest. interesting. That's nice. I mean, I really like the language um, that uh, Surat used in an interview going back to 2004 with Daniel Birnbaum about uh, to know the other is to melt your intellectual frame. Um, and I, I, it's, there is something really beautiful uh, also Indian in just seeing knowledge as, as a form of becoming. It means um, limiting the self in, in many, many, many ways, um, especially one's uh, sovereignty, or, sovereignty or dominion over others, other objects, um, uh, um, species and so forth. So um, thank you. Great. Uh, should we, are we moving on to Q and A now, or I should I? Time, yeah. Let's yeah. just let's go there. Great. So first of all, I want to say um, that I think some people had issues with the live stream, and if you couldn't follow the session, I'd like to apologize and assure you that it will be made available as a recording. And I have to say, it is really worth watching again, even if you have seen it. I'm also happy to say that Michael and Indy will both join us on the Telegram right after the session, so you can also talk to them there. And then Michael, I just wanted to say that I really love your voice and the kind of attention you gave to the session. I felt in such good hands in your panel and in the presence of your thoughts, Indy and Sarat. And um, now let's take some questions from the, from the Telegram stream. There was one question um, around um, the question of decolonization. So that there is an obvious need for decolonization of knowledge, and there's much talk about that. But what would that actually mean in your terms, and, and how would we get there? I think this is probably for both of you. If I may, Michael. Please. I do. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, right. Uh, yes, I think it's a crucial question, but we shouldn't see the question of decolonization as simply a contemporary question. This has come up again and again in the history of thought and ideas and knowledge. Uh, we, we have one way of thinking of it in the earlier part of the 20th century, and then a second way of thinking of it through the experiences of um, uh, articulated in the work of, say, someone like W.E.B. Du Bois and, and the African-American experience, but not seen only as the African-American exp uh, African experience, but he connected it to the rise of the darker continents, as he put it, the rise of the uh, colonized world. And that was one model of seeing what it could mean to look at the other side of consciousness beyond the Eurocentric. And uh, in, in his famous work, Dark Princess, Africa, Asia, the Dark Princess of India uh, and the uh, African and Asian uh, participants in this uh, getting together and the African-American Matthew Town uh, 
come together and learn how to overcome the various forms of identification given to them in the colonial and imperial world in which they have grown up. Then there is a third phase where we arrive at post-colonial thinking, which comes after the colonial world had found independence. And it meant decolonization meant political independence of sorts, but it did not entirely mean mental decolonization. And perhaps today we are stressing that dimension of, de of decolonial thought, though this is much more of a Mediterranean Lusophonic concept coming from Southern Europe and the Portuguese Spanish speaking worlds of uh, the Southern hemisphere. But it, in its generalized form, it has come to stand for taking apart those elements of the mind and those elements of thinking and those elements of knowledge that we find hold us back. These are mind forged manacles to use uh, Blake's famous uh, phrase. Uh, the, the, the point is that how do we do it when we are, as um, Indy has pointed out to us, when we are using a language which is uh, in itself a language that has promoted a kind of colonized thinking. So here maybe we turn once again to new inventions around the English language in Creolite, in the language that is produced in the mix of indigenous languages with English, with colonial English, and the production of a new way of thinking that comes out of creolized language, or what for me a bit more radical than the creolized state of things is a pigeonized language, that the moment of pigeon uh, is the most burning moment of meltdown of old perspectives and frameworks of thinking for new ones to emerge. Or indeed, we might, um, looking from within English, look at thinkers such as James Joyce, who said he would dissolve the English language till it was totally unrecognizable as English. And it would keep the professors busy for a hundred years until, of course, we had produced the truly deep colonized language of the future. How is that to be produced is still a question, but uh, yes, the whole question of knowledge takes us immediately into it, the issue of its decolonization of its categories, concepts, modes of conceptualization, and then modes of expression. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. I, is, I'm not sure if there are more questions, but I thought I'd just turn this to Indy quickly. Um, yeah. With, like, to envision, um, well, we're talking about decolonizing uh, knowledge, uh, so much of the, the Western knowledge or colonial project or program has been related to uh, reason, scientific rigor, and so forth. And um, I would be very interested in um, how you interpret whether or how reason or rationality can fit within consciousness because the way you yeah. described knowledge as being in relationality where is reason and rationality there yeah so i mean it's a uh, it's uh, i mean firstly just an amazing answer by surat and i um i suppose you know for the purposes of this talk let's let's what if we didn't talk about decolonization but going beyond colonization and the reason why that's important is that I think one of the things of decolonizing is to assume there was something better prior, right? Um, and actually, I think what we will see is, is additive colonization pretty much throughout history in all parts of the world. So colonization, which is the thesis of control, it is we have been continuously in an act of colonizing. And whether it's empires in Asia, or whether it's other empires of thought and control in other places, the number zero was not constructed in Europe, it was constructed, the abstraction was constructed in the Middle East. Uh, so 
I wonder whether one of the problems is in, in the construction of the debate or, or the discourse is problematizing the past and thereby putting us into tension with our own existence. Actually, whereas maybe another way is to recognize all the errors of history, but recognizing what we always have to move, do is recognize that as a, as a human species, we have got to a point and now we need to go to another relationship with the world. And I, and I wonder whether in a philosophical sense, we've been captured by the activists. Um, and actually we need a different language, which is purposeful and interventional, recognizing the violence of history that's been perpetuated all over the world and whether we need a different thesis. And that's why I think colonization for me is not a, a discourse just about Western theory and Western practice. Colonization is a thesis of power and the abstraction of power and its relationship with the world. And I think what we're now really, that's why I go back to slightly boringly my point about it's the reconfiguration of our relationship with the world that allows us to move beyond colonization as a thesis of, of organizing. And, and it allows us to move forward on a, on, a, on, on a together path. And I think we wouldn't have got to this path without the attraction that we did. So this is my the point. I think we're not getting rid of rational thought. I think rational thought has its role. It sits in a framework of a broader thought. And I think that it's a complementary nature of that that I think is critical. And our interdependence and our being able to see all the other dimensions of being is vital, not just the singularity of designing our institutions to amplify a single component of being human. So, uh, so just to say, so for example, humo economist economic theory is largely constructed on the idea of humans as self-interested actors that can be externally extrinsically motivated through financial gain. We know this is actually not true in any of the sociological studies that are done, but that has become the mechanism of organizing our institutional economy and thereby rarefying a component one micro dimension component of humanity and extrapolating it is to the macro incentive system. And that thereby creates all the colonization powers, structures and everything else, or one aspect of it, not all of it. So I suppose I'm just, I'm, I want to playfully, I want to challenge the thesis of maybe decolonization is problematizing us in a way, rather than recognizing this as a phase transition of humanity to a thesis of a new relationship with the world rather than actually trying to problematize our own histories, which leaves us vulnerable to nothing. Uh, it leaves us with nothing to grab hold of. But actually we have to recognize and move forward. Hmm. Sorry, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, that's true. And I think that's very important uh, that we see it as a project that's leading into a future rather than simply a, a chipping away at past oppressions as it were, important as that is, because I think it, it leads us to perhaps come back to what Michael said, that if rationality is totally associated with the Western project, what kind of rationality was that? And are we therefore speaking of an expanded, almost an alternative rationality that begins to emerge? I think this has been debated in quite a few circumstances. I do know with my colleague, my late colleague, Ulrich Beck in Munich, this was a, a major question. Is there an expanded rationality, a new rationality that we have to develop? If we take a thinker like Achille Membe in Johannesburg, then Achille Membe is speaking of delire, the idea of a kind of surrealist madness, that the Western world might have put onto African ways of thinking, seeing it as, well, they're crazy, they're thinking in a crazy way. But is this associative way of thinking not already a kind of uh, uh, sort of preliminary new rationality that we have to rethink, that we shouldn't dismiss as just superstitious ways of thinking in which imagistic lines are drawn up or sequences are drawn up and the idea that rationality is somehow purely a western thing is also part of the colonial and this is why we have to think back in history to is part of the demotion of the 
big mm -hmm. systems in, say, Indian philosophy, which were highly okay. rational in, in their ways of arguing, in the, in the forms of logic, in fact, far more subtle systems of logic, which went beyond Greek syllogistic thinking. And that has been well discussed in philosophical circles. I don't want to get too rarefied about this issue, but uh, from these bodies of evidence, Ashina Membe, Indian thinking, and the fact that creolization itself is a futuristic uh, production, yeah. is about emergent uh, forms of consciousness rather than simply grievances about the past. It's not an, uh, about the past only. I think all of that shows that there is a model of an expanded rationality that we can quite legitimately ponder and, and examine in, in, in other practices or practices that we set up what I call in the joint learning uh, situations and strategies that we consider. Can, can I just say on that, that the rationality itself, we, we, often, see it, see it, uh, we often see rationality as a function of the individual. Whereas I think what all the research is telling us is rationality is also a function of context. So it's not an isolatable act. So you put people in an economic recession, they will make different rational, rational choices to if you put them in a different context. So there's a contextual contingent component to rationality, which is often disregarded. Uh, and I love your term about a broader uh, sort of fuller thesis of rationality, which I think is a really key point. Sorry, Julian and uh, Michael. That's right. I have the unfortunate task of cutting the conversation short now that it is really going. I will definitely watch back that last um, part of the conversation. It was really fascinating. So thank you, Sarat, Indy, and Michael. And um, I want to do something a bit unconventional because there are a few more great questions, and I suggest that we take them into the Telegram chat. So there was this question, um, if you no longer prioritize learning in formalized institutions, you know, but instead take seriously every day as a moment of learning, where does it leave the university and the lab or the museums for that matter? So I suggest we leave that question and take it into the discussion in the Telegram chat and um, where I'm sure this conversation will continue. So I would like to thank you one more time and please stay with me in the Zoom until we get um, permission to leave. And with that, we will conclude this session with the film Mermaids or Aiden in Wonderland by the Carabin Collective and after the screening, we will have a long break to grab, grab some food before we continue with access. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.